Connecticut, uh, Stanford, uh, Connecticut, uh, and we will we will have a educational webinar on the IVF and the surrogacy uh, during this uncertain time. You know, there's a there's uh, uh, IVF and the surrogates have become even more challenging considering, you know, we, we hear the recent news, you know, how it negatively impact male fertility, your sperm count, et cetera. So we, we're gonna go, through, uh, Dr. Levy is uh, gonna go through the IVF. Um, maybe we'll add a little bit on the you know, COVID-19 COVID side, you know, how, uh, is how you navigate through this difficult time. And I will touch on the, topics of a surrogacy, how you get matched, and the, the, the cost of a surrogacy, what are the financing options, and uh, in general, what do we do to ensure that you would have a smooth uh, smooth journey? Uh, there's there's, a, there's a quite a bit of overlap. Um, clinic will handle the medical clearance and the transfer and all that, so we're gonna, we're gonna go to that later on. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna pass the mic to you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Levy. Uh, thank you, Bai, very much, and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be invited to uh, this webinar. And uh, thank you for all of you who are out there, whether it's morning, afternoon, or night, wherever you are. So uh, my name is Dr. Lavi. I'm the director and the uh, founder of the New England Fertility Institute. And I would like to take a few minutes to try and give you a lot of information. I've tried to condense it as much as possible. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the, uh, the surrogacy egg donation process, the way we do it, uh, and sort of give you sort of a step-by-step -step of how the process is done. Uh, and of course, I'd like it to, as, as Bai mentioned, I mean, this is, these are sort of strange times with COVID and how that impacts uh, what we do. And I'd like to maybe spend a few minutes uh, talking uh, talking about that. So this is our clinic. Our clinic is located in Connecticut, in Stamford, Connecticut. And uh, as you see here with those uh, little arrows, we are practicing very strict uh, COVID protocols to make sure that we keep everyone safe, our staff and our patients. Uh, I, I just wanted to give you sort of a quick overview of who we are and how uh, we uh, will do our best to help you achieve your goal and how we will work with uh, Patriot Conception to make your process uh, simple, safe, and successful. So we'll talk a little bit about why we're successful, our experience, how we provide a service, the convenience of being in Connecticut, and cost, and as I said, I will mention uh, how we manage, how we work through and around the COVID-19 pandemic. So in two words about myself, I've had about 30 years of experience in the field. Uh, my training is in fertility and IVF. And over the last few years, um, because of my interest um, and my passion for this particular area, uh, I've focused on what we call third-party reproduction, which is egg donation and surrogacy. You know, our clinic uh, practices a state-of-the-art technology for uh, IVF, which basically translate into uh, doing genetic testing on all of our embryos and freezing all of the embryos. Uh, that allows us to actually get a very high success, which is up to 80% for a single embryo transfer. And because of uh, our particular interest in egg donation and surrogacy, uh, uh, naturally we also work with, with the individuals and couples, uh, not only in the US, but also uh, internationally. So we have a lot of experience navigating those challenges of especially now working with people who are not in the US. Uh, as far as our location, we're very, convenient to the New York airports. We're about one hour away from uh, uh, JFK and LaGuardia. So we're on the East Coast. Uh, and even though we are convenient to the airports and even though in the past, we actually asked that you would come to us to start your journey, uh, we're now have, because of COVID, have realized that there are different ways to doing it. And we're able to actually allow you to start the journey without coming here 
and allowing you to freeze the sperm wherever you are and ship it to us. And as I said, you know, collaborating with Patriot Surrogacy is, is key uh, with their experience and their resources uh, and allows us to basically make it simple, safe, and, and hopefully successful. Uh, our clinic is relatively small. I'm the only physician. We have a, I have a great and very friendly staff because I always felt that the emotional part of this process is very, very important. Uh, so we have uh, basically, a, a, we call them journey coordinators or coordinators that will basically be uh, your case manager, someone who will follow you through the process uh, and different points and will know your case very well. And they're the ones that are going to help you navigate through all the different parts of this process that I'll show you in a minute. And uh, for our, our Mandarin speaking clients, we have a Mandarin speaking coordinator that again, will make the process a little bit more convenient. Uh, and I think Bai will talk about the financial part, but uh, we will offer different packages uh, because again, we're aware of the fact that this is an expensive proposition an expensive process. And I think that there is, if there is a will, uh, we always find a way to make it work. So to make it sort of just to keep it simple, uh, when we talk about the process of, uh, of uh, surrogacy, IVF, we talk about three parts. We talk about the sperm, we talk about the eggs, and we talk about the uterus. So in this case, uh, uh, we hopefully will be able to use your sperm. Uh, of course, there's always the option of using a sperm donor. Uh, for eggs, we can use, you know, your female partner's eggs or an egg donor. And of course, we'll use a surrogate uh, that will uh, carry the pregnancy. So I will focus on, on these three components in the next few, uh, few minutes. So as far as the medical screening, uh, I'm just showing you here what we do to make sure that we pick the best egg donors and the best surrogates. So the, both the egg donor and the surrogates go through a very, very uh, extensive, detailed screening, which includes a medical evaluation, uh, overall looking at their general health. For the egg donors, we also wanna make sure that they have good eggs, what we call the ovarian reserve. So, and then we do a, also very uh, in-depth psychological evaluation uh, to make sure, of course, that they're psychologically uh, intact, sound, healthy, uh, but also to make sure that they realize or they understand what they're going or putting themselves through, that they have a full understanding of what impact that may have for them in the future. Because we're very careful for both the egg donor and the surrogate to make sure that they have a good experience and they have no regrets after going through the process. Uh, for the egg donor, but not for the surrogate, we of course do a very, very detailed uh, genetic screening to make sure that there's no medical conditions in the family. And also to make sure that there is a genetic compatibility between you and the egg donor. And of course we do infectious disease testing for both uh, for the egg donor in particular is a requirement by the FDA here, uh, but to make sure again that they don't carry any medical conditions and to make sure that the surrogate is protected. As far as the sperm, as I mentioned, uh, we will do an evaluation of the sperm to make sure the sperm is good and it can be used for IVF. And, uh, uh, as I said, all this can be done locally. So, so we have actually changed our practices because of COVID. In the past, we used to actually ask you to come to the US, to come to our clinic, to give us a sperm sample, and we would then keep the sample, freeze it, and then use it later on for the fertilization. And what we've learned that, you know, that actually step may not be necessary. Of course, you're always welcome to come in, but because of the difficulties in travel, we can actually start the process without you coming here. So essentially we will help you arrange or we'll find a place where you can go that will safely and securely freeze your sperm. 
and do all the testing that we would have done if you were here. And then we arrange for that sample to be shipped to us and kept frozen until a point where we need to use it. So in other words, the first step in the process, which is usually looking at the sperm and making sure the sperm is okay, can be done uh, locally. And here in this slide, I show you in, in basically in one picture, the entire process. And of course, we're talking about the IVF process, in vitro fertilization, and we're doing the process in two very distinct parts. The first part is where we create the embryos. In order to do that, we need the sperm and we need the eggs. So in this case, if it's going to be your sperm, we make sure we have the sperm in our clinic. And then we will help you um, with, uh, uh, in collaboration with the uh, Patriot Conception, find an egg donor. Once we have the egg donor, once we have your sperm, we can make the embryos. We create the embryos after the donor has been on medication for a couple of weeks. And those eggs are harvested, they're fertilized. We grow the embryos in the laboratory for a few days just to see which of those embryos is the most viable, the strongest. And then we also do some genetic testing to make sure that they're also genetically normal. And once those tests are done, the embryos are frozen and they can stay frozen for a week, a month, a year without impacting their viability in any way. So we have those embryos in, in frozen storage. Uh, we have all the information, the genetic information on those embryos. And by the way, when you do the genetic testing for the embryos, of course, you can also find out what the gender is. And if you wanna use that in, in your journey, that's absolutely fine. And then uh, once the surrogate is identified, once we find the surrogate and she completes her screening, uh, and she completes the legal process and all the things that are required, uh, we then will bring her in and, and start preparing her for what we call the frozen embryo transfer, the FVT. And usually within three weeks of starting her cycle, um, after being on some hormone medication, she'll be ready to receive the embryo. And so at that point, we take out usually one embryo and put it, put it in her uterus. Uh, the reason I say usually one is uh, sort of this is always my preference because we are trying to avoid any kind of complications in the pregnancy. So we try to avoid having multiple pregnancies, twins, triplets, and so forth. And the thing is that with all the testing that we do on the embryos, uh, we're able to get very high success even with a single embryo. So in the olden days of IVF, which is five or 10 years ago, uh, we used to actually transfer several embryos with the hopes that one of them takes, and sometimes none took, some of them, sometimes one took, and sometimes all took, and we ended up with a problem. So nowadays you have more uh, success and more control. Now, having said that, uh, if you are interested in having what we call it a, a twin uh, journey, in other words, having twins, uh, we can discuss that, and then we will have to find a surrogate who is not only willing to carry twins, but based on her medical history, is also able to carry twins. So if we transfer two embryos to the surrogate, the chances of her becoming pregnant is over 90%, and 60 or 70% of those pregnancies will be twins. So that's, a, again, something that we discuss in our initial consultation, and we will try to the best of our ability to accommodate uh, your, uh, your requirements, your needs. Um, the egg donor, as I said, we pick them very carefully uh, to make sure that we, they have good eggs and to make sure that they're healthy. So the donor goes through the medication and usually generates somewhere between 15 and 20 eggs. And if once you go down this process of fertilizing the eggs and growing them and testing them, usually end up with about five or six genetically normal embryos. So it sounds like a big drop from 20 to six, but just keep in mind that those are the best of the best. Those embryos have a very, very high chance of success. And in the surrogacy process, when you listen to all these descriptions, it sounds you know, somewhat complex. 
and sometimes maybe a little bit intimidating in a way, uh, because there's many different moving parts, many different things have to happen and have to happen just right. Um, I tried to list here uh, how we work with the surrogacy agency. And for me, you know, having a good connection, a good relationship uh, with the agency is key because many of those things that I list here have to happen at the same time. And many of them happen behind the scene. So we try, you know, to the best of our ability to remove all those stressors from you and just allow you to focus on the important parts of the process. So for example, I'll just quickly show you, you know, this, the agency will find a surrogate that meets your requirement. They will follow the medical criteria that, that we provide as far as her health and how many pregnancies she's had and cesarean sections and other medical issues. Once the surrogate is identified, uh, we will do, the clinic will do her medical review. So I check her medical records, make sure that she's okay. And then we will bring her to the clinic to complete her evaluation. Once the evaluation is complete, you will go back to the agency and they will help you finalize the legal contract. And once the legal contract is done, and if you remember by then, usually the embryos are already uh, frozen in storage, we can complete the, the medical procedure. The agency and Vi will explain that will also help with financial arrangements with the surrogate and provide support during the pregnancy. Uh, I will be in charge. I will be medic the doctor of record or the surrogate's doctor for the first trimester of her pregnancy. So even if she's not local to us, I'm still responsible. I'm still in charge. And once she gets to the end of the first trimester and the pregnancy is going well, we will discharge her to the care of her uh, OBGYN. Uh, a few words about COVID-19, uh, because, you know, that's, of course, has come to dominate everything that we do or think nowadays. And for many people, it was sort of a pause to say, well, maybe it's not a good time to have, to, to have a baby. Maybe we should wait. And I'm, I'm just sort of my, my thoughts about the COVID are here and I'll explain in a minute why. So, so when the COVID first hit was in, in, in March, uh, we closed the clinic because we really weren't sure uh, exactly what it means for pregnant women, for the babies and so forth. And we started to gather data, to gather information. And with all that information, I became comfortable opening up again in May. But then I said, well, you know, uh, we're going to open, we're going to do everything, we're going to have all these protocols in place, but are people actually going to come? Because, you know, we, who knows how, what people are thinking. And surprisingly, actually, it's been really, really busy. I think people have maybe had time to think about their life and priorities and decided that it's, they would like to start a family now. And what I can tell you that from my standpoint, you know, we can do a lot to make sure that COVID-19 does not affect the outcome of your pregnancy. So I say here, don't panic, of course. Uh, you have to respect the virus. You don't ignore it, you respect it. You have to educate yourself and you basically have to learn to live with the new reality. One thing uh, that is very important to understand is that you know all the testing, all the all the uh, studies that have been done, show that basically um, the following things. So first of all, the the virus does not show up in sperm or in eggs. So it has you know the virus has certain propensity to certain organs like the lungs, for example, but it doesn't go to the reproductive organs. The other thing that's very important, of course, is to make sure that the virus doesn't cross to the baby. So if a pregnant woman develops COVID, uh, we wanted to make sure that the baby doesn't get the, the, the disease. Because for example, we have a bad experience from uh, Zika virus that does cross to the baby and cause a lot of damage. So there's been a lot of studying and basically the conclusion is that it's very, very unusual, highly unusual that the, vi the virus crosses to the baby. So that was very reassuring. And the other thing that, that for me was very important is to make sure that 
a woman who's pregnant doesn't have a worse course of the COVID compared to a woman who is not pregnant. And, you know, there's been more and more data that's coming in that shows this to be true, that women, because mostly they're young and healthy, uh, even if they develop the condition during pregnancy, they usually, it, it, it's not a very severe condition. So all these things tell me, you told me that it's okay to start and that there's no need to wait until the pandemic is over. Having said that, of course, uh, you know, we pay a lot of attention and I spend a lot of time speaking to the surrogate, making sure that they understand what they need to do to keep themselves safe, what they do, what the husband does, what the children do, her children, and make sure that they create a safe environment. So once they understand that, and I have to say, and you know, this is true in general about surrogates, that the surrogates are highly, highly motivated to do a good job. Uh, in fact, I find often that they take better care of themselves um, when they're pregnant with your child compared to their own pregnancy. So it's, it's really more about making sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, we test the surrogates uh, throughout the process. And of course, if they have to travel to the clinic, we make sure that they do it in a, in a safe uh, manner. And here again, just to show you again, because that's really, really important, is that they've done studies looking at women who developed COVID and looking at their babies. And they looked at virus in the nasopharynx and where normally the virus is, they didn't find any. They looked at virus in the amniotic fluid around the baby, they didn't find it. Cord blood, breast milk. So in other words, the virus does not cross to the baby. And just to, to finalize basically um, how to start, how to start the process and the timeline, just to give you a general idea. So like I said, we usually start with creating the embryos, which means that you'll get your sperm frozen, you'll find an egg donor, and then immediately we will start creating the embryos. Now, generally most people, just because they want basically to have the baby in a reasonable uh, time, time span, they usually start this all in parallel. So they start working on getting the sperm, they start looking for an egg donor, and then they start looking for a surrogate. And typically for most people, they find the egg donor and they have the sperm before they have the surrogate. So as I said, the embryos are created and frozen. You find the surrogate, she is approved, you complete the legal process, and then you, uh, you schedule the embryo transfer. So from start to finish, I'd say the timeline, you know, conservatively from if you start today, there's a very good probability that you'll have a baby within about 18 months. So I think that's sort of a realistic timeline. <clears throat> I just wanted to give you the contact. This is my contact, uh, my email, my cell phone. I'm very hands-on, I'm very available. If you have, if you wanna have a quick conversation just to talk about your case, uh, I'm more than happy to do it. Uh, Linda is the, uh, the director of the program and she is also available to talk about financials and so forth. And I will hand it over to Bai. And again, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Levy. And uh, by the way, uh, if you're interested in schedule initial consultation, uh, or if you have any any question in regards to their clinic, uh, I'm going to send a, a quick button on the screen. So if you go to the center of the screen and click on contact us, at least uh, lead you to uh, the website where you can fill out your information and choose your pr uh, preferential uh, appointment time. Uh, and they will, uh, the representative will reach back uh, and schedule you for the appointments. If you or if you have, just have some general questions, uh, feel free to call and. Uh, uh, they will get your, uh, 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 you know, questions ad addressed. And uh, uh, the first slide is about a sur surrogate cost. Uh, I know that's that's probably the most concerning part um, of, you know, uh, building family through surrogacy and egg donation. Uh, so I, this this slide represents uh, the, you know, the number in majority in, in the state of California because everything, the cost of living and everything is a little bit higher. Uh, and also the surrogate candidates you were able to find in, in California is, uh, you know, uh, they're just simply more competitive, you know, because since 
California is one of the first states that, um, you know, where surrogacy, uh, gestation, gestational surrogacy are widely practiced. But, uh, you know, in a place, uh, we do have a surrogate from all over the country. If you're looking at, if you don't care, uh, if you do, uh, if that's less of your concern, the geographic location of your GC is less of your concern. Um, surrogate from other states, particularly on the East Coast, Midwest, or the South, are um, are significantly significantly cheaper. You can save uh, you can save you know more than ten thousand on that part. Um, so I'm just talking about in general, you know what what the fee constitutes. So pretty much the surrogate screening and the management fee, you know, for the agency. So pretty much before we pass the candidate to the clinic, that consists of you know the screening of their criminal background, their to to obtain all their medical records. We do have, have an on-site nurse, nurse to to pre-screen all their medical record and and and, and, and uh, put a notes on every single one of the prop you know uh, the past medical history that what will be um what, what, what would ne negatively impact her ability to become a surrogate and we'll pass that all that notes and uh, all her medical records to to the to the clinic later on. Um, and also, what we're looking at is uh, we do a soft pull on on their uh, credit report to make sure she doesn't have any significant outstanding financial debt uh, because we don't want the you know making money become her primary motive. Um, so that's roughly that part. Um, and we do sometimes it depends on the uh, uh, in, in terms of criminal uh, criminal record. Uh, we, uh, if the surrogate is not from surrounding area, because we're located in California, we will send a private private investigator to do a quick home visit to make sure she lives in a good environment. Uh, you know, and we don't accept applicants <clears throat> that live in a Section Eight voucher uh, housing. The top, uh, you know, so pretty much uh, make sure she has a you know good comfort, uh, comfortable living environment. And legal fee, um, every state's a little bit different, but um, and the of course, in California, it costs a little bit more, but in other states, uh, it costs uh, a little less than that. So basically, it consists of two parts. One is the the surrogacy contract. Um, so intended parents would appoint uh, their own attorney to draft up the sur uh, uh, the surrogacy contract, and uh, the surrogate will gather independent counsel to help, help to help her review. Uh, and then negotiate, um, you know, the terms and conditions on the surrogacy contract. And once that's done, it gets notarized. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we call it legally clear, and she will, um, she will then uh, move to the, then the the clinic will then start the FET count, the frozen embryo transfer calendar. She will start to take, you know, injectable medication to to get prepared for the transfer. And the the next big part is the surrogate benefit package. Not only does it include her base compensation. Uh, uh, like I mentioned, um, in the state, um, you know, in, in other states, they're significant lower. It also include, you know, miscellaneous al allowance to cover the mileage, the, the, you know, the wear, you know, pretty much the wear and tear of her car because, you know, she, she constantly have to go to a fertility clinic, then later on obstetricians, um, um, then, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, the prenatal supplements, um, so all the miscellaneous stuff her pre, uh, pre, her maternity clothing, of course, as her body changes, she will need a different set of clothing. And uh, and uh, uh, some, some stuff like uh, housekeeping after she get, you know, she were, you know, heavily into her pregnancy, then, you know, she uh, was not very convenient for her to move around to clean up the house. So uh, starting in a certain weeks into her gestation, um, she will start to get housekeeping. Uh, allowance to help her cover that. Uh, the other thing, the last part of the surrogacy cost, it, it kind of fluctuate the most is the surrogate surrogate insurance cost. Um, if you happen to uh, be matched with a surrogate during the open enrollment, we call it open enrollment window for our international guests. That's between normally for the majority of the states, so between November first to December fifteenth. Uh, in some states, they extended it. For example, New York, uh, New in the state of New York, uh, like right next to Connecticut uh, and the California. In California, this year they extend all the way to the to the end of February. But in majority of the state, is you know, or the the federal law, uh, you know, determines is is you only have that forty five day window. But 
if, if you start to get uh, lucky enough to get enrolled during the open enrollment period, that's a significant significant savings uh, on on surrogates maternity um, care medical costs. Um, if you uh, if you didn't if you weren't lucky enough to get that, you know, still there are many factors that determine if you can get a regular Affordable Care Act insurance. Um, for example, if the surrogate changed her zip code, she you know she you know she moved to a new job, but um, if she if very unfortunately she couldn't get those kind of insurance, you know there are there is there are a few specialty insurance normally backed by the lawyers of London, uh, even though the cost is significantly higher, but you know we still have options, and the the least option we would you know we would uh, we normally would uh, advise strongly against is to pay cash because you know it is just simply too uh, too many uncertainties of course if uh, it's up to you if that's what you decide to do you just got to you know um we 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 just going to advise you there's a strong possibility you know anything anything happen your medical the surrogate medical bill will skyrocket and uh and uh, you know, because you you guys have a legal con a binding legal contract, you know you are obligated to pay whatever medical cost uh, incurred during her uh, during the surrogate uh, surrogacy journey. So that's something we would strongly uh, advise against. Okay. So yeah. So after we did the initial screening of her criminal background, her you know her, her driving uh, driving record to see uh, any reckless behavior, her you know, credit uh, credit report. We um, we we get her all her medical record. Get a pre screen to make sure it's ESRM compliant. Before we pass her uh, medical records to the clinic, you would have a what, what we call it a match meeting. We do have an online pool for you to see all the surrogate profiles. So if you go to the center view screen um, and hit uh, hit the button learn more, that leads you to a profile page. Um, where you, uh, you know that you, you have a filter on the left hand side. You can choose the state, the, min, the, uh, the minimum age, maximum age, experience surrogate. Once you click into any of the, any of those profile, you'll be able to see her more detailed information. And uh, we do have a appointment booking function uh, right on there. So if you like to meet uh, any of those, you know, big hearted women that's willing to help, uh, that's the that's the advantage of using our online an online surrogate profile pool. And uh, after after you match with the surrogate, of course, there are some many many factors that determine if it's a good match. Um, you know, for example, religious uh, religious belief used to have you know uh, parents and a surrogate like you know are both very devout um, you know Christian. They you know they they like to. Uh, you know, and, and the, the parents want wanted to wanted their future baby to to be affected in in in, in a particular way. Uh, so they look for you know Christian only surrogates. We do have other cases where, uh, just like Doctor Dr. Levy mentioned, you know, there's a uh, parents that only wants wants their surrogate to carry twins. And uh, you know, in the application, we will ask you. You know, there's a many 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 things that we ask uh, during the application process. <laughs> Your religious belief, your you know your life philosophy, your life attitude, uh, some trivial stuff. You, you you know your favorite movie, your you know your favorite childhood uh, dream, something like that. That would kind of give a give intended parents. Well, intended parents have the same you know have a very similar application too. So pretty pretty much it will uh, you know big or small, it'll reflect your 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 general you know life philosophy ideology to see if you guys a good match. Then, you know, during the match interview, if you guys live close close by to each other, of course, that will be in person. And that's preferably that, you know, that's the ideal way to do it. Uh, majority of the cases, um, you would do a Zoom call, but still that's a good way to, f to kind of fill it out um, if, if uh, you know, you guys are the right match. And then after that step, you know, you, uh, your medical record will get reviewed by the clinic. Uh, and the clinic will, you know, will, will make a determination, you know, whether you are, you know, you're, you're good to become a surrogate. If so, you, then you will physically go, go into the clinic and the uh, doctor, you know, uh, the, I, the intended parents physician will check, uh, you know, will check the uterus, uh, you know, to see if the uterus is lining at the right uh, thickness. And of course, there are, uh, there are a bunch of other, you know, required blood work and tests to see if, you drink, if you're taking drugs, if alcohol, you know, tobacco. And all that, and, you know, all, and all different uh, 
uh, benchmark to make sure that you uh, you are suitable for a surrogacy journey. Uh, and in the meantime, you will go through a you know a psychological screening evaluation to make sure that you're mentally fit to become a surrogate candidate. And then after that, I kind of already explained you know there's a surrogacy contract a surrogacy contract part. Uh, and after you graduate from uh, IVF, ten, uh, approximately 10 weeks after the frozen embryo transfer, then you will get to that pre-birth quarter. In majority of states, it's called a pre-birth court order you know, in California. So pretty much you, you get to establish your pr uh, parentage even before the baby's born. And uh, so uh, once the baby's born, the, the, the certificate of birth uh, those those state uh, uh, the uh, the issue uh, will have your name instead of instead of a surrogate parent's name on it. So that, that that's one of the advantages to choose state where you know pre birth court orders are allowed. And unfortunately, both you know Connecticut and uh, California allow pre birth court order. In other state uh, where surrogacy is legal, but pre birth pre uh, pre birth court order is not allowed, uh, you can still do it post birth. It's just a uh, um, got to spend a few, uh, you know, uh, extra time to to do it because you know, normally they will have a birth certificate ha that have a surrogate's name. If she has a partner, you know, her partner names will be on it too. Then you have just have to go to the court uh, and to you know the judge will make a determination if you're going to be a good parents. Then your uh, the name will be swapped out uh, with with uh, you know intended parents names. You know, so after ten to uh, you know uh, the regular nine months pregnancy, then you will have a you know, um, and uh, uh, this part uh, I think the most most important part is the the coordination of uh, um, insurance to make sure that you maximize you know the insurance benefits to make sure she doesn't you know the 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 candidate doesn't go out of net, uh, network to inc to incur extra medical costs. But you know that's just, you know pretty much that's part of our job to make sure that, like to. Uh, you know the surrogates uh, do what she what she's told, uh, and to help you reduce the overall cost and stress. Okay, um, and also we because of the pandemic, we come up with another option. So pretty much you're comfortable. We have a, a you know abundant education material on the website and everything. So if you comfortable to manage the, the cases yourself, so pretty much you can manage you went to many kids with surrogate, you know, and uh, remind her and, uh, you know, um, for her appointments and, uh, you know, to pretty much coordinate the whole journey by itself. We do have an option, pretty much we slash the agency fee where you only pay a flat, a flat search fee uh, for our effort to, to get you the pre-screening pre -screen surrogates. Uh, that cost, uh, that can slash another adi additional, you know, 20 to 30,000. Um, in addition to, you know, I uh, already say out of state surrogates already save you abundant money. So that's something that, would, uh, that we, we offer too. Um, if, if, if a cost is really something uh, that will prevent you from going there. And uh, a, a second option is that, uh, you know, there's a bunch of other finance, financing options because we understand there's a tremendous amount of money that you have to spend on surrogacy. So what we also do, we partner with a different uh, special specialty financing company. Uh, we work with Pro Prosper Health Landing, and to uh, to so pretty much they loan up to hundred thousand, with terms up to eighty four. And if you are if you are in the United States and you own you know real estate properties and you have a positive equity on it, that would in, that would be enough to cover it. That might be a preferential uh, financing op you know, financing options because, you know, a mortgage as cheap as it is, you know, as the long-term interest rate dropped to the lowest, you know, you know, uh, the probably the lowest in the history, uh, that would be something to think about, to take advantage of first. But if if that or home, ad, home equity line of credits is not available to you, uh, this is the other, uh, we do provide other options. Yeah, so that covers the surrogacy and the, we do, uh, and, uh, and by the way, for egg donation, we do have uh, the similar online database or online, you know, profile pool for you to go in and uh, take a look. Um, the our specialty is a high education candidate, so candidate with a, with high candidates with higher education. So we have a uh, not too many, but a few Ivy League educated egg donors. If that's something you look, uh, you strong, you know, you. Uh, you strongly care about that's something we will offer. But in general, top top 30, top 50 university, 
uh, is our specialty. So if you look for, you know, for, for example, a candidate from New York University or University of Connecticut, uh, you know, or uh, Yale, uh, so far we, uh, we did have a Yale, but it's, you know, uh, of course those kind of candidates got matched very quickly, but that's something uh, uh, that we, we specialized in. Um, okay, so that concludes my part on the, sur uh, you know, the surrogacy match cost uh, and the process part. Uh, and uh, we do have uh, quite a few questions. So, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Levy, you do, do you, how much how much time do you have for uh, for the Q and A section? As much time as you need. Okay, okay. So we can go through the one on the uh, um, on the live webinar first. And then we're gonna collect. Uh, in the meantime, Liz will collect in, uh, the question from uh, YouTube, Facebook, and also Tencent. You know, on WeChat too. Okay. Okay, so one of our guests said, I was wondering the success rate of IVF. If my first cycles failed, what should I do? Well, you know, it's of course, it's it's not an easy question to answer but without getting more information exactly, you know, who you are, your age, what kind of embryos you had, genetic testing. But I, I think in a simple way to um, what we find that if, you have a genetically tested embryo, because I saw somebody ask about that. That's, and I'm a very big proponent of doing genetic testing. If you have a genetically tested embryo, the normal genetically tested embryo, and you have a, a, a normal uterus, uh, then with one embryo, you should expect close to 80% success. Now, the, the thing is, of course, you know, it depends on your age. And, and as, as, as women get into their late 30s and early 40s, uh, the number and the quality of their eggs decrease, and 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 at the same time the quality of the embryos decreases. But if you have a, a, a genetically normal embryo, then the chances are still the same. So in other words, if you take someone who's uh, 45 and takes an uh, egg, an embryo that was created from an egg donor and is genetically normal her chances of success, having a successful pregnancy are the same as someone who's 40 or 35 or 30. So again, it's it's really just a matter of the embryos, the uterus, and of course, the sperm. Okay, and Doc, uh, I got another one. So is the can polycystic uh, patients, mm -hmm. so pretty much the PCOS or PCOS Sorry, patient. I, I can't hear. Sorry, uh, Dr. Levy. So, one one of the one of the other guys is on the screen right now. She's uh, he's asking about he or she is asking about a polycyst uh, polycystic uh, patient. So, can polycystic you know P, P, uh, or PCOS patient do IVF yeah, cycles? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, so PCOS is actually um, a very common. I'd say the most common hormone imbalance, the most common hormone uh, abnormality in young women. So we see many women with polycystic ovaries and, you know, polycystic ovaries, you know, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a term that includes many different conditions, many different hormone imbalances. So I think with polycystic ovaries, for me, the key is to identify exactly what type of polycystic ovary you have and then prepare you for IVF, depending on your condition. And that way you can expect to get better eggs and better success. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, I have another one on uh, Facebook Live, and this one is from um, First name Thomas. Um, work for uh, Google New York, uh, and our company was a contract with uh, Progeny uh, Insurance. Just wonder uh, if your clinic would accept Progeny policies. Well, we, we work with different insurance companies, uh, so we just mm -hmm. have to check to see exactly the, the terms. But yes, I mean, mm -hmm. if you have insurance and your insurance is, is uh, uh, is paying for it and we participate, mm -hmm. we're more than happy to work with you. Awesome. And uh, the next one is from Tencent and uh, it's an international guest. I think, it, well, it, even though Tencent is more like a Chinese centered, but I think it, it, this would be a good question for all the international uh, guests. So pretty much, I, uh, you know, uh, living in a, uh, want to sh minimize, you know, per, pretty much I do intend to come to the U.S. for, you know, the idea of a surrogacy, uh, potentially with an egg donor, well, what I wanted, uh, but uh, I was wondering if we can uh, pre-start the protocol since, you know, many medication can be found in the foreign country too. 
So can we pre-start the product a protocol just so by the time to minimize you know the time that we you know we spent in the in the United States? Absolutely. And we do it actually quite a bit. So it depends on where you are and we will find a local uh, clinic, a convenient local clinic uh, that will basically that we trust and we know will do a good job. Uh, depending on, again, your country, uh, either we find the medications locally or we, in many cases, we actually can ship you the medications from here. But yes, we can. And, and that way, you know, especially for IVF, because, you know, to prepare for IVF, it's about a two week uh, process. So if you have a place like that and we, we can we have good communication with them, we can minimize the number of, of days that you have to spend in the U.S. for the actual procedure. Awesome. Okay. Uh, another one is from, uh, you know, from international guests, too. Um, so pretty much, you know, we heard about, you know, how COVID would have, you know, impact, especially uh, earlier this year uh, in May, we heard about how we, it would impact male fertility. It's like, it, it, like, doctor, what you explained is it doesn't get, get into a sperm and, you know, um, uh, or uterus, but uh, what it still, it negatively impacted the long-term health, uh, especially some people when yeah. they, uh, you know, when they got the COVID, and after uh, after a while, they you know they even after after they are recovered, uh, you know they still have you know um, lethargy, for example, you know, or or, or all different kind of uh, symptoms that would ne negatively impact their uh, uh, long term health. So I wonder, like, because uh, you know this this guy's pretty much he well he was well, it's in foreign language in Chinese, but what, what he said is like my I I did have an agency that matched me with a surrogate. Later on, she was found COVID positive, uh, but later, uh, uh, but you know, of course, then she recovered from the COVID, but should uh, should I still proceed with a, with a, you know, GC candidates that have the COVID but recover uh, from a later uh, I, Yeah, so I, I, I think in general, the answer is yes. As I mm -hmm. said, you know, most of the surrogate or the candidates are young and healthy women. So even when they get COVID, it's usually not very severe and they usually have minimal symptoms and recover very quickly. Uh, in a way, maybe it's a good thing because then you know that she's not gonna get it again when she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. But but certainly um, uh, having a surrogate that, that had COVID is not, if she's healthy and she passes all the testing, uh, is not a reason to uh, to reject her. Okay. Okay, uh, on the screen here it says, how long, the entire RVF process will take. So as I showed you on that slide, from from mm -hmm. the if we have the sperm and we have the egg donor, mm -hmm. uh, we basically start with the donor's cycle. Mm -hmm. And it, it, within one month, we have the embryos frozen and tested and we get the results. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um and uh, how will the medication affect my body during and after the uh, IVF process? So the, the medication for IVF basically are, are actually natural hormones. And uh, you, I will design the protocol, the cocktail of medication based on your particular situation, based on your age, based on your hormone level. So the idea is uh, that these drugs would actually boost up your ovarian function and mm -hmm. boost up your egg production. So typically uh, for an egg donor, I said we get about 15 to 20 eggs because they're so young. Someone mm -hmm. who's in their 30s, we usually get about 10 eggs. And usually the side effects have to do with not so much with the drugs, but just the fact that your ovaries are more active and your hormone levels are higher. And we keep very close tabs on that. And that's why once while you're on the medication, you have to go in every few days to get checked. And then we see how you feel and how you respond. We make the adjustments and basically make sure that you go through the process with minimal discomfort and, and of course, safely. Okay. Um, and a question from Tencent Lai and uh, the, uh, fr so pretty much fresh egg versus frozen eggs. Well, that's actually a good question, and we can spend a long time discussing it. I, I think that um, I would just say that, you know, the technology for freezing eggs has come a very long way uh, in the last five or 10 years. So it used to be that, you know, frozen eggs were definitely not first choice. 
And uh, nowadays, you know, the frozen eggs, actually the technology is good. And when you freeze and, and use the frozen eggs, uh, the results are, I would say, almost, almost as good as they are with fresh eggs. I still, my preference is still to use fresh eggs over frozen eggs, but uh, much and I'm, but you know, again, as time goes on and the technology improves, I'm much more comfortable working with frozen eggs. Awesome. Another one from Tencent is actually on the screen right now. I'm going to translate it. So pretty much what she, I uh, just want to say, I had a last, uh, last time I, uh, I went through a fertility testing, had a, had a uh, extremely low AMH. I'm relatively young in my late twenties and, uh, uh, you know, high, uh, high range, you know, over, you know, a high range of, uh, at the higher, the higher range of uh, follicle stimulating hormone in FSH. Are they the only indicators like, uh, uh, to know if I have a bad, you know, ovarian reserve? Well, we usually use a, there is a, we call it the panel for mm -hmm. testing, which basically includes the AMH, the FSH, the estradiol, estrogen levels, and an ultrasound. Uh, and that gives you a pretty good idea of what your ovarian reserve is like, which basically mm -hmm. tells you how many eggs you have left because women have all their eggs when they're born. And mm -hmm. indirectly, those that number actually tells you essentially how many eggs you expect to get when you do IVF. Indirectly, it tells you the quality of the eggs and of course the chances of having a success. So regardless of your age, uh, having low ovarian reserve generally suggests that the chances are less. But mm -hmm. of course, you know, it's always possible. You just have to figure out how to work around it. Okay, and, uh, she, she also did add a follow-up question. So it's pretty much, uh, um, you know, I've been, you know, um, on a side note, I've been using um, anabolic and andro androgenic steroids, uh, you know, to tune up my body. Uh, uh, is that the, is, do you think that's the reason why it affects my, uh, you know, for fertility indicators? Well, the, the thing about the AMH, one of the reasons we use it as a, as, a, as a marker, as an indicator, is because it's generally not affected by most things. It's not affected mm -hmm. by your cycle. It's not affected mm -hmm. what medication you take. It's not even affected by your general health. So it gives you okay. a really true picture of your ovarian function. I see. I see. So those are all side uh, medication factors. It doesn't really impact uh, per uh, reserve. Okay. And uh, on the screen here, uh, 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 can you explain the difference, uh, you know, between three five day embryos? Yes. So, so, so actually, here this is a we have this the right slide up here. So mm -hmm. basically, once we retrieve the eggs and we create the embryos right here, mm -hmm. uh, then we start to watch the embryos develop in the laboratory, and we have certain expectation of how they grow. And basically, just by watching them, just by looking at them, uh, you can very quickly tell the difference between a viable embryo and an embryo that's not so viable. And of course, the longer you watch them, the more you can tell. So for example, the embryos can look great initially, but after three days or definitely after five or six days, they start not to look so good. So. The, 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 my preference, and you know, in my practice, I almost always grow the embryos to the fifth and the sixth day because of that inf information that we get. Also, that allows you to do the genetic testing, which is important. Um, so, but you know, this is you know, in the in the olden days of IVF, which is you know five ten years ago, uh, it was more common to transfer the embryos early, mostly because we didn't have the right technology, the equipment, the environment to create, to let the embryos grow in the lab. So uh, of course, I mean, that, that translates, if you have a, a day five uh, embryo, what's called a blastocyst, one versus a day three embryo, if you transfer one or the other, the day five embryo has a much higher chance of success. Mm, okay. Awesome. And, and another follow-up question by the, you know, the lady that I asked, uh, asked you about, you know, the, the previous ones uh, on Tinsdale, and she, uh, she also asked, uh, you know, for, just for, you know, increased uh, ovarian reserve purposes, 
Uh, is there any, uh, are there any good supplements that you would recommend? Well, the, the thing just to know about the ovarian reserve, and essentially, like as I said, women have all their eggs when they're born, and then mm -hmm. they slowly lose eggs. Uh, so we don't have any medication or any procedure that allows you to create new eggs. So essentially, you just have to work with the eggs that you have. Now, of course, in order to optimize, to maximize the chances, we use all different supplements. Uh, mostly the supplements have to do, basically are in the category of what we call antioxidants. And that basically mm -hmm. improves general health and improves, can improve the quality of the eggs that you already have. Okay, antioxidants. Um, and, uh, okay. And uh, she, so pretty much she was asking about the so common antioxidant uh, supplements. You know what? You know, like what type of antioxidant supplements, like you know, that which you would recommend? Well, one of the most common that is prescribed is is called CoQ10. Mm -hmm. CoQ10. Uh, it's 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 readily available. You can get it uh, in you know in the health food store, mm -hmm. uh, and it does. I mean, it does it does do that. I mean, it's a definitely an antioxidant, and it it basically improves the health of the tissues in the body. Okay, and uh, one other one, uh, I think uh, this one is on YouTube, and uh, I think the question is for both of us, and what are the advantages of doing IVF and surrogacy on the East Coast versus West? Um, you know, for, I guess my, uh, you know, from, uh, I kind of explained uh, that in my surrogacy call slide, this is a slide, this is because, you know, uh, East Coast surrogates, uh, because it's, not as competitive as as the West Coast, so the surrogate compensation, of course, is going to be lower, um, and uh, you know, and it's it's just it's not as popular as in the West, uh, in the West Coast. So you have a you have a less competition, have less competition, so they have a lower um, compensation. So in general, the surrogacy is more affordable, um, and and I think that's the same case for IVF, uh, Doctor Levy. Yes, you're right. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay, I think you got caught. If a cost of you is one of your concerns, you, know, you definitely save a significant amount of money by you know going to the East Coast. Especially, uh, I saw you know uh, there's a uh, there's a guest from Germ uh, Germany here uh, in our webinar. So yeah, so that's you know this is a shorter fly. I think that's another advantage. Depends on where you live. You know, uh, East Coast is a shorter. It's definitely a shorter fly. Um, yeah. So I think that's all the questions that our guests have. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Levy, for you know attending this webinar. It's really educational, informative, uh, and uh, for our guests, I, I know I, I did a call to action for you to go to a website. You know, if you are on YouTube, Facebook, you might not get the link, but we'll make sure everybody gets a follow up email to you know, so you you uh you will get all the link and the correct information. Uh, and if you ever need to talk to either one of us or one of, uh, or organizations to you know to get all your problem addressed. Uh, and uh, yeah, so still, uh, in the holidays of holidays are soon ap approaching. So uh, like to hear uh, this, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Levy and uh, I and I are wishing uh, like to wish everybody a happy holidays and stay safe and uh, we'll overcome this pandemic, especially with the new you know vaccines are coming. Um, and uh, hopefully, we'll, everybody will have a smooth IVF or surrogacy egg donor journeys uh, after afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again, Doctor Levy. You want to like to say anything to the to the guests? Uh, well, again, Dubai, thank you for having me, and thank you uh, all the participants for being here. And uh, I wish you luck. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not an easy decision. It's not a, it's a big step to take. Um, but uh, it definitely can be life changing. And you know, we are here. You know, the the agency and the clinic to try and make it real make it happen awesome all right thanks happy holidays y'all and uh yeah uh, this concludes our webinar bye bye all right bye